let folks know because I think that that's something that is uh, oftentimes known by uh, stories or details, but not known in a way that the application of it can really help you know how to live. And so I'm looking forward to preaching that for the next several months. I wanted to let you know as we kind of begin our fall quarter. It's fall already. You guys realize this? It's almost Christmas time. And so Merry Christmas, everyone. Let me be the first to say it to you in case someone uh, hasn't beat me to it already. Well, there are a couple of uh, things that I want to mention by way of announcement. First of all, uh, this is this the next next Tuesday, right? Is our first Tuesday or second Tuesday of the month? No, it's the first Tuesday of the month, and we have men's prayer. Today is the 26th, right? Okay. All right. I look at the calendar and I get confused. That yeah, I could remember what date it was if the date it, if it didn't change every day. Same as I could remember how old I am if I didn't get older every year. But uh, it's just the way it is sometimes. But we have a couple of things that are that are coming up there and. Um, I want to just encourage you uh, to commit this fall to being involved with the ministry of this church. There are going to be a lot of opportunities this fall season for us to be able to do some events that rarely are opportunities to reach people that don't normally attend our church. I think specifically, as I mentioned that, of my uh, neighbors, Julio and Sylvia, who are in New York City right now, but who are not yet born again. And last fall we had Thanksgiving dinner invited them to come to that and they've been attending when they're in town they've been attending every evening service in the entire time that they've been here and I think are very very close to receiving Jesus as their Savior and sometimes some of these events that we have that are a little bit unusual last year we had a little bit of a concert at Christmas time and it was well attended and those are opportunities for us to be able to reach friends family neighbors people that maybe normally would be uncomfortable coming in to a church house and let me just say something about that a little bit uh, do you know that coming into a worship service like this one this morning uh, should probably not be the most comfortable thing for someone who doesn't know Jesus as their Savior? In other words, if somebody uh, comes to this church and they're not a believer, they ought to feel welcomed. They ought to feel loved. We should be very, very friendly to them. But there ought to be things about worship of God that says, I'm not part of that. I don't know if I belong in that. That's how real worship ought to be when you come before the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's one of the reasons, by the way, we go out to reach the lost. I'm not saying that the gospel isn't preached inside the church, but we're supposed to go into the world and preach the gospel. And it's nice to have a place we can come into and not only worship, but uh, preach to the believers. And so I just want to just mention that by, uh, by way of... Uh, giving you a little bit of thought, something to, to just ponder or to think about. I have been wondering about how to incorporate worship in our church. been really burdened about that. Have you? Has it been something as we've gone through our worship series that has been very, very thought-provoking? As for me, and one of the things that I've been concerned about is how awkward real worship would seem to somebody who isn't accustomed to coming into a church or being in a place like this and uh, how you'd feel in, in a situation like that. And one of my thoughts that I've had by way of conclusion is that we came together to worship. And if we don't worship, then someone who comes wouldn't even know what worship is. And so uh, we certainly need to have that. I, I see in my mind the picture that I, that I looked at of uh, Muslims in a mosque bowing before a false god. And of uh, Christians in a church dancing before the true god. And my conclusion about both of those, that neither of those are actually worship, not true worship. And so we need to model that in our lives and have a particular amount of reverence in our services when we come before the Lord. And uh, it's so, certainly fulfilling and satisfying to do that which we have been created to do. Uh, you may have noticed that some of the projects uh, that are that are in the church bulletin are still in there and we're approaching the end of the year. And let me just give you a little bit of an update about that. We haven't replaced the bus floor yet for a couple of reasons. The primarily, primarily the one is that we just haven't had the extra finances come in to take care of that. And nobody's fallen through the existing one yet. So we're just gonna, <laughs> we're gonna wait until we can afford to do that. Some things we are in need of in order to be able to enhance our ability to teach and to do our services is for us to replace our uh, television screen. And we're thinking that we need a minimum of 55 inches. That's the size of that one. And from 
the couple of times that it worked, we we were uh, satisfied that it worked well enough where it's at. You know, we thought initially we needed one on either side. We found out that we were able to do with just one of those. And so that's a project that's coming up in the near future. And then also the uh, mural. You may have a question about what's the mural wall? Well, the neighbor's building here, which is actually larger than most billboards, is uh, available for us to use to advertise the church. When you come around the corner here, if you're coming just down the street, uh, it's sometimes it's easy to pass by and turn around the corner without even noticing our church is here. And there's only so much you can do to enhance a location. So, but one of the things we're thinking is when people are coming from Dixie Highway, though, a nice mural on that wall would be something that couldn't be missed and actually could become a landmark in this area around here. I can think of three or four murals in this area that are well known. And so that's what we would like to do. We want to depict on that wall, um, a, 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 we want to depict Golgotha with the crosses on Golgotha, and then we want to depict uh, the garden tomb on the wall, and then we're going to put John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever sort of believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the verse we're putting, right, Lee? Okay, I thought so. Uh, Lee has a uh, depiction of it. If you're artistic, we're not. So, if that would be something where you could help with, we do have a plan and a way that we're planning on doing it. We're planning on actually projecting it onto the wall and then doing it in stages of different colors of paint. And so that's a, that's a project that we hope will happen this year. Uh, that's there. Also, the, it, there's a note that says study area. Currently, I don't have a place for my books. Now, I can sit in any chair anywhere and move my laptop there, but I don't have access to a lot of the things that typically I would use to study and have not for about four years. And so I'd be a better preacher probably if we had a, a dedicated study area, and that's something that we're hoping to try to figure out in the form of some type of a shed or box or something like that Jumbo that we'll put in the, What is it? Jumbo jet. A jumbo jet, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Tosh. Sorry. Okay, that would work fine. I could study on a jumbo jet. <laughs> so, we could all study on a jumbo jet, couldn't we? <laughs> and we'll just move in there for our next location. Just land wherever we want to meet that week. Okay, uh, in all seriousness, uh, that's something as well. Uh, the, frankly, the projects that we've done this year have been really, really needful as far as our facility goes. We, um, and you know, when you're, when you're regularly in a place, you know, beauty, they say, is in the eyes of a, of a beholder. And also, a lot of times, when something's familiar to you, you don't see fault with or you just don't see anything that other people see. And initially, uh, we didn't have any lighting in our parking lot, and it was really, really dark out, particularly when the street light failed as well. And if you're a visitor coming up to a building like this, which already doesn't quite look like a church building to begin with, there are a lot of questions that you would have, and so we did get that fixed. That was an important one. Our uh, parking lot needed to be resealed. That was an important one. Uh, the German Shepherd dogs were enjoyable by some, but not by everyone, and so the fence was an important one this year. But we've had a lot of things. I just noticed this morning when I pulled up, the swale is already looking better than it did, and the stump is certainly a big improvement out there. <laughs> I like that a lot. But we've gotten a lot done this year. Next year, we're not going to schedule so many projects, because, but we're going to be scheduling all church outreach projects that we can all be involved in. I would like to hear some feedback from you about maybe people that you're thinking, no, I wish I could reach this person, and if I just knew how, or here's an idea of how we could reach some people like them. Uh, if you would have some ideas that you would like to share with me or ways that you'd like to be involved, before the year starts and we begin planning the different outreaches, I'd like to hear from you about that. Also, again, uh, sometimes we're not familiar with what things look like to other people. And if you see something and you say, Pastor, this is just tough for me to get past, and uh, this, this bothers me about our facilities or about our service or whatever it is, please know that um, if you hurt my feelings, I'll cry, but uh, I'll listen to you and I'll hear you. And I'd like to, actually, it probably won't hurt my feelings. You might not tell me something that hasn't already occurred to me, because oftentimes I 
know there are problems, but I can't fix everything right away. Uh, but it might be something that could be simply easily fixed, simply if uh, the suggestion were given to us, and we're open for that. Okay, that's enough. Those aren't announcements. Men, uh, please take a look at the dates for men's retreat, November 1st through 3rd. And is this as of yesterday that the cost is? No, that's no. last week's. Do you mind looking at last week's bulletin here? No. No. Okay, it wasn't updated. Last week, a round trip was 258.35 for a round trip to go to Nashville, leaving on the flight that we're all on. If you'll notice, that Thursday flight at 2.13 leaves you the space to be able to work until about noon on Thursday. So you really only need, if you're off on Saturdays regularly, you only need to have Friday off, and you could probably work a half day on Friday, or you could do like Charlie does and show up at 3 a.m. and start working, and you'll have a full day's work by the time you get off at noon. So anyway, I woke Charlie up. He just looked up at me. All right, he does He does leave for work some days at about 4 a.m., uh, but he works all the way in the Keys, so that's why. That's it for announcements this morning. Everything else should be in the bulletin. If you'd like to write me a note or mention something, uh, feel free to jot it down on the guest information card or the prayer request portion and drop it in the offering plate, and that way we will uh, be able to have any communication you'd like for me. Where's our men at? There they are. Every man should have stood up if I see that. <laughs> All right. As, as these gentlemen prepare for taking up the offering, let's go ahead and dedicate it to the Lord, shall we? Father, thank you this morning for the opportunity to give, Lord, an opportunity to see your grace in our lives, to have you uh, give us divine revelation, really just show us actually what it is that you want from us. And God, an opportunity to exercise stewardship. I pray that as we give this morning, that you would have from us everything, not just what we put in the offering plate. And that, God, you'd be glorified by that. Then also I ask that you would bless what's given and bless the giver. God, I do ask that you would bless the people of this church who are faithful to give in a very special way so that they could know your hand is upon them. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Observant of someone that needs one and grab one for them. Revelation and chapter one is actually what we'll be at this morning, and we're beginning a series actually uh, this morning in Revelation and looking forward to that. Revelation chapter one. We'll get the kids back in junior church and uh, get all settled, and then we'll begin. Revelation chapter 1. I want to just read the first uh, three verses which come to a paragraph or come to an end of a paragraph. And then, if you'll permit, I'd like to look down to verses 19 and 20 and we will uh, get our text for this morning. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto, the servant, unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Notice there's a colon there, and then this simple statement, for the time is at hand. Okay, so blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Now will you please look down with me to verse 19. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. 
the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven saint candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Now we'll pray. Father, please help us this morning, even as we begin to look at the present aspect, even before we begin that. Lord, just as we begin to set our minds in such a way that we could receive the blessing which is promised in this book which has prophecy revealed in it. Please help us now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Revelation is always a timely study, isn't it? No pun intended. Revelation is always a study of the Scripture, which is an appropriate time for us to study. It will be, in many ways, it will be something that will be a current event in the future. There will be parts of Revelation that are future that will be current events. And I suppose if you are one who were here, when heaven is opened up and God in His wrath is sending angels with the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, uh, and, and inflicting His judgment on the wicked. I suppose if you were here for that time, it would be one of those books you could be looking at, okay, now what is next? What will be happening next? Uh, but honestly, the truth is, is that much of Revelation is written for the intention, with the intention or for the purpose of helping us to be able to know how to live today it's not just a book that's about the future. Now, when you talk about prophecy or you talk about we're going to tell someone we're going to be studying Revelation, one of the things that I notice is that a lot of times people will say to me, well, you know what I love about Revelation? And oftentimes they'll tell you about an event in Revelation. You know, it's when Jesus comes and He's on a white horse and or someone will say, well, you know what I love about Revelation? And they'll talk about what they see on a Christian news channel where current events are evaluated in light of where we at as far as the return of Christ and the events of Revelation. Uh, literally predicting uh, times or trying to figure out when Christ is going to return. Uh, and that's a, that is a uh, response when you mention that you're going to be studying Revelation. But it's interesting as we look at our text this morning that Revelation isn't about our looking forward to something that's going to happen in the future. It's actually about our knowing how to live in the present. And you know, it would be a real help for all of us as believers, practically speaking, if we don't live in the past and if we don't live in the future. You know, the present is oftentimes sacrificed for the past or for the future by individuals that want to focus on the past or focus on the future, but they are not concerned about throwing away their future and throwing away what will soon be their past because of the focus of the same. We are in a time when it's, as always, it's important to study the prophecy of the Revelation because much of the evangelical church is going Catholic when it comes to the application of the Revelation or future events. You say, Pastor, what I mean? I mean, there's a trend today, a current trend, where believers are taking a Catholic position of making Israel and the church one and the same. Instead of Israel being distinct and the church being uh, a, distinct, uh, a distinct dispensation or a, uh, distinctly, uh, a distinct time period where God is working in a certain way, by the way, I'm not saying here because individuals that are teaching these things are that the word dispensation is a stumbling block to them because what they think that you mean because of others that are on the extreme side of that, they think that you mean that people are saved differently at different times. And that could be, couldn't be further from the truth. If you want to understand how salvation is, read Romans 1-5 through 5 sometime. When in the church at Romans, the Jews and the Gentiles were trying to figure out, are we Jewish? Are, we suppo are Gentiles supposed to be Jewish? Is the church Jewish? Where did the church begin physically? Where? Jerusalem. Jerusalem, right? So the church began at Jerusalem. What do you suppose ethnically the makeup of the first century church was comprised primarily with? Jews. Jews. You know, there's a foolish notion today that people that are Jews according to the flesh don't get saved. And it is absolutely ludicrous because the first believers were Jews. And actually... Jews do get saved. 
all the time. They get saved exactly the same as Gentiles do. And I don't know ethically what the uh, comparison of it would be. I would just simply say that individuals that are willing to be open-minded and look at who Jesus is, whether they're Jewish or Gentile, when they see the truth, they receive Jesus. And it matters not what you are ethically. The, the notion that, uh, that God has rejected the Jews for salvation, no, they can be grafted back in right now. And you can see that in Romans very, very clearly, very plainly. But it's popular today for individuals who are ultra-dispensationalists, as we might call them, to say that salvation was uh, being born again or being saved or received by God, accepted by God, was different at different times. And nothing can be further from the truth. And Paul illustrates that using the example of Abraham. See, if you're saved by keeping the law, there's no guy that the Jews would claim more than Abraham as their father, right? Isn't Abraham the father of all nations? Isn't he the founder of the Jews? Not Israel, but the founder of the Jewish nations and Jewish people? Yes, he certainly is. Well, how was Abraham saved? Well, the Bible says he was saved by faith, and his faith was counted for righteousness. Oh, did Abraham believe in circumcision? Yes. Did Abraham keep the law? No, there was no law until after Israel was born. And Israel didn't keep the law. Jacob didn't keep the law. How was Jacob saved? Same way Abraham was. There was no law of Moses until Moses was born. And there was no law of Moses until later on in his life when God's Holy Spirit had given the law through Moses. And so salvation has never been by the law. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. We're told in Colossians uh, and Galatians, we use the illustration of the law being a schoolmaster to school us about our inadequacy, to teach us what sin is so that we can know we've sinned, so we know that we need Jesus. And the way to receive Jesus is by faith. Salvation in every age has always been by faith. It was by faith that Cain, one, the first generation, by faith, Cain uh, or Abel have offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain was. not So salvation always been by faith. For your reference, go to uh, Hebrews chapter 11. But there is a trend today in the church, and a trend uh, in, particularly in the evangelical church, to, to um, try to reorder end-time events. And the claim is that what 1 Thessalonians 4 plainly teaches and what Revelation plainly teaches, as we'll begin to see today, is that the next event on God's calendar is not Christ appearing in the sky. Now, that's not the second coming of Jesus when the Lord Jesus calls us up. That's Jesus coming to call up His saints. And we will not, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4, prevent them which are asleep. The word prevent being an old English word which means to supplant or to take the place of or to go in front of. And so we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord are going to be caught up together with Him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so what they have done, these individuals that are teaching what the Catholics teach, and that is that there's no Israel, there are no future events for Israel, all the events in Revelation, the, the kingdom that Christ is going to establish with the 12 tribes of Israel specifically named, is not a Jewish is not a Jewish kingdom. My friend, it is. It's Israel, and it's actually Israel. And God is preserving even the unbelieving Jews who will one day, as a nation, those that remnant that remain are going to believe. And they are going to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And the Bible teaches that very plainly, and yet it is disputed uh, very, very uh, vociferously in places where it oughtn't to be. I think if I were, to, if, if I were God and I knew hearts, I think I know the motive behind the false doctrine, but uh, I'm not going to tell you because I don't know hearts. I just know that it isn't a pure motive to teach those doctrines. I think oftentimes the result of it is that men follow men instead of following Jesus. And we want this, we want this sermon series to be all about Jesus. And so we're not going to be mentioning what people believe that's wrong. We're just going to teach the Word of God here. And that's what Revelation is going to be. I want to ask you to do a couple of things as we begin our series in Revelation. First of all, I want you just to uh, be as open-minded as is possible for you. Do you realize every one of us are beings with prejudice? We are all prejudiced. Every one of us have a predetermined disposition to prefer what we think or what we believe versus what may actually be the truth. And no person who is unwilling to say, okay, show me where I'm wrong. 
Show me what's wrong about my way of thinking. No person is open-minded who does that. I see people, and by the way, this is a comfortable way to sit. I see a lot of people sitting like this right now, and I don't think that you're sitting there saying, you know, I'm not going to hear anything. You ever see somebody, though, that folds their arms? Leans back, and, and what do they mean by that? Like, I'm not listening. And uh, I know what I believe, and I'm not hearing now. I, I realize, don't don't feel uncomfortable. I don't think that it's, I'm looking out seeing people folding their arms. <laughs> I don't think that's what you're doing. I think it's just a good way to, to, to suspend your arms with little effort. Okay, so I think you're lazy, but I don't think, you know, okay. it might be a way to keep warm as well. Uh, but the reality of it is, is that I see people that, you know, this is their gesture. I dare you try and teach me. I dare you try to overcome my objections. And they act as though when you preach sometimes as though it's a timeshare a sales presentation where you're trying to, you know, <laughs> trying to sell them something. And I'm not trying to sell you anything, but I do want to preach and teach the Word of God. And if you think you know everything there is to know about uh, the mystery revealed, the revelation, you can't be taught much, if anything. And so let's just open ourselves up to truth. I'm not saying open yourself up to anything. Years ago, I realized I don't have to expose myself to evil in order to know truth. And so I don't try to go out and just know everything that could be known. There are things that, that knowing could have a bad effect on you. Let me illustrate it like this. I don't have to know what it's like to be drunken to know that drunkenness is evil. I don't have to try a drug to know that the drug is is dangerous, deadly, and addictive. You understand what I'm saying? Others, I don't have to try something to be able to know it. And I don't have to know all about uh, certain sins. When you open yourself up to things, you become vulnerable. I'm not talking about sin. I'm talking about truth. And many of us are not open to truth. And by the way, when you open yourself up to truth, one of the things that you are uh, doing along with that is you're saying, you know what, if I don't know something, I'm willing to learn it. And if I do know something and it's wrong... I'm willing to say, okay, what God's Word says is different than what I believe, therefore I'm wrong. And that's pretty simple, pretty easily accomplished for each of us. And so I just want to just propose that to you. Third thing I'd like to ask you to do, and that is for you to make this series in Revelation a matter of private study, personal study. Uh, I can read through the book of Revelation in a little more than an hour of time. And so right around an hour is how long it takes me to read Revelation. Uh, that's not very long, actually, is it? No. You think about it? So if I were to break that up into segments of 15 minutes, I could read it in four 15-minute segments of time, or just maybe a little bit more than that. I never do read it that fast, because I always stop and cross-reference or look up something or ask a question or whatever, uh, so it's very rare that I actually read through it. But for the sake of this sermon series, I did sit down and read through uh, chapter 1 to the end of Revelation for just to find out how much is it I'm asking of people if I'm asking them to read through it. Now, I will say this. I read a lot, and I read uh, probably faster than the average person does. And so maybe if it took you five hours over the next couple of months to read through Revelation and to kind of make it a matter of personal study, it wouldn't be too much, would it? to ask. And so I would ask you to do that. Internalize it. And my prayer, this is what I'm asking God for, just so you know how I'm praying, and you could pray the same way. I'm praying that God would help me not to take something which is intended to be simple and to make it complicated. So I'm praying that God will let me uh, simply teach the revelation. And I'm secondly praying that you'll know the content of revelation by the time you're done with it. And I'll illustrate to you the reason why. Again, this is like last week where I have a short message and so I spent a lot of time and in the introduction you say, he hasn't preached anything yet and so I'm afraid we're going to be here all day. Well, you may be here all day and that's what you're here for, but that actually isn't my intent at all. But I do want us to uh, really have established what we're trying to accomplish. And what I've noticed sometimes is that people want to study topics more than they want to study, you know, the entire bit of material. You ever read a book and you're just waiting to get to the, the chapter? You know, this chapter? Because, and, and I'm not talking about fiction even, I'm talking about, uh, I'm actually talking about um, uh, like a, a, an autobiography type thing. For instance, this last week I was uh, reading the autobiography of John Adams, the second president of the United States. And when I 
first, before I purchased the book, I opened it and I saw something about Adams and being the first American uh, ambassador or diplomat minister, the first American minister to England. And I was really looking forward to getting to the chapter where he actually said what he said the first time that he addressed King George. Because if you remember right, uh, John Adams had said some not nice things about the king of England. And if you'll remember that the, when Americans declared independence from Britain, that that was the crime of treason, treason which had a death sentence. And so I just think about the first time John Adams, who was sentenced to death by the king, ends up having come out on the winning side of the war and goes into the presence of King George... What do you say to a guy that planned on killing you? And what do you say to a guy that you were responsible for writing the pamphlets that made Americans rip his, um, his what do they call the, the charter or the arms, you know, the picture off of the, out of the federal uh, house and burn it and, and knocked over his statue and, and burned it in the streets and so forth. What do you say to the guy? I mean, the things that John Adams said about King George were not nice. And the things that King George planned on doing to John Adams weren't nice. And I was looking forward to just the quote of their exchange, what each of them said together in that meeting. So I, I really reading through a book that's this thick, and I'm trying to get to that chapter. Don't do that with Revelation. Don't be like, I can't wait until, you know, Jesus speaks the slaughter of all of his enemies and uh, the battle of Armageddon happens and, and those events. Don't be like that. Don't go to Armageddon. Let's go to Revelation chapter 1 in the beginning. And because Revelation is a chronological book, as we'll see this morning, we need to look at it in order. You know what chron chronological means, right? It means in order. It means a calendar order and a, a chronological order of events. Until the Holy Spirit of God gave the prophecy of the Revelation to John, there was a lot of confusion about future events. There are a lot of unfulfilled prophecies to national Israel. There are many unfulfilled prophecies to national Israel. And when Jesus finished the work of the cross, the logical question that the disciples had, remember uh, in Acts chapter 1? Remember in Acts chapter 1 when Jesus, the, Luke is giving the example of how the church got started and he talked about the things that Jesus uh, did before that. The Bible says, being seen to them 40 days and teaching them things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So 40 days after the resurrection, before Jesus ascended to heaven, he spent personally with his disciples teaching them about the kingdom of God. About the, and now it's, that's a different kingdom than the kingdom of Israel where Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign. You, see, you can see that all through the New Testament. So he taught them for 40 days that. We know that uh, in 1 Corinthians that Jesus or that, that Paul mentions that Jesus was seen of more than 500 brethren at one time after the resurrection. So a group of more than 500 people and Paul said at that time that most of them were still alive who had been eyewitnesses of the resurrection. And so we know that Jesus taught a lot about the kingdom of heaven. But before he ascended to heaven, the disciples asked him the question. They said, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Is it time for Israel to have her kingdom restored? And Jesus said, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath placed in his power. So Jesus said, I'm not going to tell you that but ye shall receive power. And he goes on to illustrate, we're living in the church age right now, and it's time for the church to have power, and that's where our focus is going to be. Listen to me, will you please? It is of vast importance for us as we study events in Revelation, which are ultimately about God's future kingdom with Israel. It's important for us to realize the time in which we live. This is the day, this is the age of the church. And there has never been a better time to be alive than this age which we refer to as the age of grace, where salvation and the work of the cross have been fully completed, where Jesus Christ is no longer going to have a future event of mercy, but while mercy and grace are still in effect. Do you realize that by the time we get to Jesus Christ, 
sitting on his throne as king of Israel, he will not be in a merciful, uh, he, his, his throne, it will not be a, a place of mercy and grace. Whereas the first time Jesus came, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came looking for sinners, individuals who are ungodly, who were his enemies, and he came for the express purpose of dying for their sins, sacrificing his own life for theirs, and becoming a substitute so that God's wrath against them could be satisfied through his death. The next time Jesus comes, my friend, he'll come to destroy sinners. That's what he'll be doing the next time he comes. He won't be coming to seek lost sinners. He'll be coming to destroy those individuals who didn't receive him. Don't forget the age we live in is an age of grace. And it's the best time to be alive, my friend, right now. The opportunity that we have to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to, uh, to sinners. And that they can receive grace. All oh, for the person who'd say, oh, God's a judgmental, hateful God. Well, my friend, God is not a... God is not a hateful God. God's a God who hates wickedness and He hates sin and He's right and just to do so. And in His grace and His mercy, He turned His wrath on Himself, on His own Son, so that we could receive His mercy. If that isn't love, my friend, what is? What is love if that is not? And so let's go to, to uh, the first three verses here in Revelation. And we'll see an introduction. First of all, we'll see who it was to. In... Verse 1, the Bible says the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now notice the pronoun which God gave unto him. Notice the pronoun him. The precedent or the antecedent for that pronoun is Jesus Christ. Now you and I, <clears throat> we don't... I have the ability to understand the Trinity in a way that we could explain it. We can simply say that Jesus is fully God. Jesus is fully God, and yet Jesus Christ has submitted Himself to the will of God. And when Jesus was asked about a future event, uh, even this morning in Sunday school with the teenagers, we were looking at when the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus and asked, if when he came into his kingdom, if one of her sons could be sitting on his right hand and the other on his left, and Jesus said, it's not mine to give, but the Father's. And we see a subordination of God the Son, who's fully God, to God the Father. When Jesus, before he went to the cross, said to God the Father, nevertheless, not my will, but thine, we see a subordination in the Godhead of God the Father to God the Son. When Jesus went down to Jordan to be baptized by John, and John said, I have need to be baptized by thee. Jesus said, Suffer it to be so now, for thus becometh or behoveth the will of the Father. In other words, God wants me to do this. He wants me to submit to something which is beneath me, being God, and He wants me to submit to a man. And, and when, the, when Jesus came up out of the water, they, they, everyone heard a voice from heaven where God said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. What pleased God by Jesus' baptism? Well, His surrender to the will of the Father and His surrender of setting aside His ability as Creator God, as all-powerful God, uh, to work only not in His own power, but in the power which God gave to Him, the power of the Holy Spirit, which Jesus said we're able to have the same that's why when Jesus said, greater works than these shall you do because I go unto my Father, it's not because we're greater, but because of the way that Jesus was subservient or submissive to the will of the Father. You say, Pastor Price, do you understand how Jesus could be God, and God the Father could be God, and God the Holy Spirit can be God, uh, and they could three all be one? <clears throat> No, my friend, they're coexistent, they're co-equal. I believe what the Bible says of, about Jesus. But if I could understand God, I might be able to be God. And guess what? I'm not. I'm created by the Creator, and I believe everything the Bible says about God. So individuals that want to debate the Godhead, my friend, the Bible's clear about what it says about God. It's very, very clear, and I just believe it. There are some things that I can study, and I can have a better understanding because I've studied but that I cannot completely understand because it's beneath me to know. There are many things that are not revealed to flesh and blood. 
And this, this doctrine of the Godhead is clearly taught in the Scripture, but my friend, not completely understood by anyone. There's a debate about that today. Matter of fact, someone called me a couple weeks ago to know where I stand on the whole uh, quote, they call it oneness, it's just nonsensical, uh, extra-biblical words and terminology. And they want to know where I stand and who I stand with. I stand with the Word of God, my friend. I believe what the Word of God says, and I don't care uh, what fools are trying to get their own following or uh, come up with their own thing and, and all of that. I don't just believe something because the church has always believed it. I believe it because the Bible says so. You can't know all the answers and you can't know everything. You can simply know what the God says and believe it. And if you could understand the Godhead, perhaps you could be God. I don't think you could, but perhaps you could be God. It's not something God's given us to fully understand. And you're an arrogant fool if you think that you understand it when you cannot or you understand more than what God tells us. You can only know what God tells us and you can know enough about God to know that what He says is true. And so you can believe Him. And I believe God about the Godhead. Let's leave it at that this morning. But this is a reference to Jesus being given uh, the divine truth. Do you remember <coughs> when the disciples asked the three questions in Matthew 24? And in Mark 13, and they said, When shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Three questions. And <clears throat> when ultimately they wanted to know, when is Jesus going to return? His answer was, No man knoweth, the Son of Man doesn't know, the angels don't know, only the Father knows. And so this would be one of those things that evidently, in verse 1, has been revealed to Jesus. And I don't understand that completely, but the Bible does clearly state it there. Do you see that? Him, the antecedent to Him, is Jesus. Now, we're approaching noon, in case you're not watching your clock as carefully as I am. It's four minutes until noon. We don't have a rule hard and fast that we're out of here by noon, but I do try to be finished by 1 p.m., so I'm going to get a good start here in just a second. <clears throat> the Bible says in verse 2 about John, who bear record of the Word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ in all things that he saw. Now, verse 3 is where I want to focus because, again, this is our encouragement to begin our series. And, and really, that's what we're doing right now. We're not getting into Revelation. We're getting ready to get into Revelation. The word blessed here. Blessed is he that readeth. Now, I could ask the question, do you want to be blessed? Here is evidently an implication that it is God who's blessing. I have had people bless me, and I don't mean to be disrespectful or to have you the wrong... Have, the wrong impression of me, but I thought, I don't need your blessing. I've had people uh, curse me, and I thought, I'm not concerned with your cursing. Uh, because really what matters to me is God and His countenance toward me. And if a man's against me and God's for me, or if a man's for me and God's against me, frankly, none of what man thinks matters. What God thinks matters. And God's Word here says, Blessed is he that readeth. And so there's a promise here, and it's a, it's a fairly offered universal promise to a person. There are three things that a person is supposed to do to have God's blessing. Would you like God's blessing? Yes. yes. And when I see in the Bible God promises to bless people that meet these qualifications, I think, sign me up. Give me the process. I'm in. I want to be blessed. I want God's blessing. I desire it in my life. And so what's a good reason for preaching through Revelation? Well, there's a blessing. There's a blessing in our studying it. Hey, so listen, my friend. I'm not blessing you with Revelation. I'm going to preach the Word of God. I'm going to try to help with your understanding. I'm going to challenge you with application of Revelation. But this has to be your study for you to have God's blessing. So don't invest yourself a little bit. It's frustrating to me uh, when people, uh, and even myself, when, when you invest something in it and you don't get everything out of it because you didn't invest enough. You know what I'm talking about? You ever uh, start to a workout program and you don't finish it? Amen. When do you lose sleep when you exercise? When is it that you exercise and you lose sleep? It's that first hard workout, right? You say, Pastor, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm telling you, when I hit it hard the first time, my body hurt so badly, all the lactic acid and all the responses of my body to it, that I writhe at night. I mean, I'm just in pain. I'm tossing and I'm turning and I'm losing sleep. And that first workout, man, better count for something. You better have a second one and a third one, a fourth one, because 
if if you work out and you go through all that pain and you don't get any benefit by it, all you did was put yourself through something for no good reason. There's nothing uh, no good in it. You ever heard the phrase "throwing good money after bad"? Throwing good money after bad. I'm a throwing good money after bad guy because once I've invested in something, I don't want to lose my investment. I just I want to get something back out of it. I have a policy, and I hope you don't think I'm extremely not nice because of this. I, I will get some witnesses for you if you think I'm not nice. I'll find some people that think I am nice, and I'll let them tell you otherwise. But I have a policy if someone wastes my time of getting something out of it. For instance, if I go to a fast food restaurant, I know you say, Pastor, you don't get anything out of rest." Uh, fast food restaurant. Good. Well, I, I don't disagree with that. But if I go to a fast food restaurant and I spend an hour in the drive-thru, they took an hour of my time and I promise you, I will, you know, I'm going to get my pound of flesh for it. I mean, I'm going to call corporate. And I'm going to, if the store manager doesn't care, I'm going to make sure that they hear from me. They took my time and before all things are said and done, I'm going to get some, some degree of satisfaction that they didn't get away with wasting my time. You say, Pastor, that sounds vengeful. It probably is. Uh, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, if somebody does something and, you know, and they, uh, they take my time or they take my money, I make sure that, that it has something tangible. There's, there's an end to it where it's like, well, now you've got my time. I'm going to finish it. You wasted my time. We're going to waste some more until this thing's done. I'm not walking away from this thing. And I have a little bit of that in me. Of, I'm not going to start studying something or I'm not going to begin a class and not get a credit for it. You know, I don't understand people that enroll themselves for a class and they pay money and then they fail it. It's like, pass your stinking class. You paid for it. Learned something. You went there. You invested your time. Pass your class. You know, and not just to get the credit, but to get what you went for. Get your money's worth. Well, you do that with Revelation. In other words, if you come to church the next several weeks and you say, I want God's blessing, so I'm going to church, but you don't study Revelation, you're going to miss the blessing. If you study Revelation, but you don't show up for church, you're going to miss it. See, get your money's worth is what I'm saying. Go ahead and just invest yourself. You say, Pastor, you know what? I might have to cancel something. You know, there will be a lot of things in your life that are less important than God's blessing. In other words, this should be pretty high up there on the whole priority scale. And so I just want to encourage and challenge you that. The Bible says, blessed and see and read, and that's not the end of the statement. Uh, the second thing it says, and uh, <clears throat> that they that hear the words of this prophecy. Now the word here is the word akuo, which simply kind of means not deaf. In other words, you have the ability to hear. And the fact of the matter is that there are individuals who, though may not be physically deaf, see, a person can be physically deaf and still hear the words of the prophecy of this book. But there are individuals who can physically hear, but they don't have the ability to hear. Over and over in the Scripture, uh, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the command is, if you've got ears for hearing, then listen. And it wouldn't do us any good if we were to approach Revelation and say, yeah, I'm going to get the blessing out of Revelation. I'm just, I'm just here for the blessing. I don't think that there's anything for me here to learn, but there is a blessing here for me. So I'm here for the blessing, and maybe I'll pick up something that I could apply on your life or I could to correct about you. No, we need to have the mindset of saying, I want to hear. I want to learn. I want to know truth. So he that hath ears uh, to hear or the person who reads is blessed, and he also must hear the words of this prophecy. And the prophecy is foretelling of future events. And then the third part, and this is, I think, most insightful and, of course, makes the introduction most appropriate. You see, verse 3 is the last word of the introduction to John in the scenario where he's at Patmos. And it's the last thing you say in an introduction that's usually the synopsis and the most important thing of it. The last thing said is, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Okay, when is the living out the events that are taught in Revelation, when is the most practical time for that? Now. 
right now. The time is at hand. <coughs> I'm not bashing. I'm not being silly. But if you listen to Jack Van Impe on T, is he still on TV, TBN or see he, he's a thing, a relic of the past. He's still there. Thank you. Okay, I think he's still there. If you listen to Jack Van Impe on TBN, he is taking things that are events in the Middle East, the uh, Arab nations and Israel, descendants of Abraham and the infighting between them, and he is taking those events normally and trying to say, okay, it's about time for Jesus to return. When Jesus said, no man knoweth the day or the hour. And he spends a lot of time, and forgive me, uh, the other, the, what's the little fat guy? Uh, that's not a nice way of putting it, is it? Uh, the, yeah, John Van Impey. Jack, Jack Van Impey? No, John, John Hagee, thank you, that's the fellow. Yeah, John Hagee, you know, with his big posters on the wall and, and sharing his future events and all these things. And you, I, I, watch, I watch the audience of people in their... Uh, reclining chairs or you know their theater seats all watching these events and all I'm thinking about is I've tried a couple of times to listen to John Van no John Hagee I'm sorry I mixed the two John and Jack uh, but I've tried a couple of times to listen to John uh, Hagee and my conclusion is there's nothing that he's talking about that has any present day application it's all future and I think that's where the attraction to uh, studies of Revelation that don't deal with the present tense, but deal with the future event. When's God going to do this? What's going to happen? We're always looking at other people who are doing something, and so we never have to look in the mirror at ourselves and say, what am I doing? And I will submit to you that a Bible-based practical study of Revelation will leave you with the thus saith the Lord, that means this is what I have to do today. It's not about God's going to do this in the future. I'm just waiting for Him to do something. We all want to sit around and wait for God to do something. But my friend, right now we're supposed to be doing something ourselves. And any preaching that doesn't say get out and go and do isn't meeting the purpose or the practical application of Revelation. You see that? And that do the words of this prophecy for the time is at hand. When's it time for us to live out the Revelation? Now, one last thing I want to see, and perhaps we'll elaborate on this next week, but uh, verse 19 of Revelation. <clears throat> we will go back next week for certain and look at John and the, what he saw here on the Lord's Day. Verse 19, the Bible says, Write the things which thou hast seen. This is John who's being told this. The things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. Now, help me with something. Past, seen. Past, present, future. Past. The things which are. Past, present, future. Present. The things which shall be hereafter. Past, present, future. Future. John and the Holy Spirit are good grammarians. And they know good writing. Uh, John and the Holy Spirit know that one of the things that you do in any good uh, volume or book or letter, and this is a letter that's written, is you say what's going to be said, and then you say it the way you said you're going to say it, and then you conclude by repeating what is said. Right? Did you learn that when you learned to write letters in, uh, was it kindergarten or first grade? When's the first time you wrote your letter to Grandma and Grandpa? In school, y'all, y'all didn't do that. How old were you? Sixteen. Fourth <laughs> grade. I remember writing. Okay, fourth grade. I remember learning how to write letters. You learn how to write a, a personal letter, a business letter, and what were the different types of letters? Uh, but you were taught in the letter. Oh, a thank you note too. Yeah. Thank you letters were things that you wrote. And for a project, you had to write something. So I had to write Grandma and Grandpa. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. Uh, <laughs> uh, but write a letter to Grandma and Grandpa. And one of the things you're supposed to have is a greeting and then an introduction, and then you're supposed to say what you said you're going to say, and then you're supposed to repeat what you said and conclude it, and then sayonara or sign off your signature. Okay, so I know how to write a letter still from kindergarten or first grade, one of those grades, I can't remember which it was. Uh, but the reality of it is, this is a letter. And John is saying, write the things which were, the things which are, the things which shall be hereafter, and guess what? The things in the Old Testament that are events that you're like, well, when's this going to happen? How's this going to be? And you have all these questions about, they're all put into order 
because Revelation is chronologically written and helps you to know the order of things. For instance, when you study and you read, you'll read up to chapter 3 and you'll see the present tense. The past tense is chapter 1, which we'll see next week, where John tells about what happened when he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. He tells us what happened to bring him to this place. The present is the letters to the seven churches, and we're in the church age today. And the future is chapter 5 and forward. Chapter 4 is a transition chapter where John talks about his experience of being caught up to into to heaven in the spirit and seeing the throne of God. It's what we preached last week if you were not here in our Sunday morning service. And the chapter 5 is all future events. And you never see the church again referred to ever in Revelation in chapter 5 through the end of the book. And so I hope that will help you. If you want to uh, find out whether these things are so or not, read Revelation this week. You could do it and you'll come back next week ready for our series. Father, thank you for what we've learned this morning. Help us with the practical application of it. God, I believe that I stand in the midst of an assembly who desire your blessing. And so, God, I pray that as a church that we will have some specific applications, some commands, things that we'll obey that we'll learn in the next several weeks. And I pray that you would just use those things, God, as breakthroughs in our lives for us to know our purpose and know how to live for Jesus. God, I pray that the comfort that's in Revelation for us would be sought and had uh, by each of us. And then I pray uh, that you would just have your way with us as a result. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for your great attention this morning. You're dismissed.